Today's episode of In the Trenches is brought to you by System 12 Guitar Method. Sign up today at lionroxy.com. In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy. Hello, 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 and welcome to another live stream episode of In the Trenches. I'm your host, Ryan Roxy. Uh, come on in, everybody. Get into the chat right now, the live chat. Um, if you're watching this on a delay, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate you listening. Uh, we appreciate your ears. We also appreciate your eyes. That's why we want you on Ryan Roxy official YouTube channel. So if you can make your way over to the Ryan Roxy official uh, YouTube channel, you can hit that subscribe button right now. And uh, if you're new to us, you know the drill, folks. Just hit that subscribe button. Hit the like button. It helps out the algorithm. It gets us to see uh, more eyeballs on our videos, more eyeballs on our podcasts. And this is one of those podcasts you do not want to miss today. So it's been a while. Nice to see you. Um, I am back um, after a nice, uh, nice long leg of touring with Alice Cooper. We're going back out for a few more shows to, to end out the uh, touring cycle, but I thought I could sneak an episode in right now. And uh, today is one of those episodes that I've been looking forward for a long time. Um, you ready to dive in the trenches? I am too. So again, yeah, Brian Roxy YouTube channel. You get get it on the live chat. I appreciate every single one of you that's in the live chat right now. Uh, put up your comments. Uh, we'll put them up. If it, the conversation goes in that direction, it goes in that direction. But I'm ready to go. Hope you are too. Okay. Our guest today exemplifies working musician. Whether it's in front of the studio glass, behind the mixing board, in the writer's room, or on stage with some of Rock's most iconic. He's been there. He's done that. I was lucky enough to work with him back in the day, recording guitars for his first solo album called Inhale. And countless recording sessions later, here we are to talk about his newest single, California Smile, plus so much more. Would you welcome into the trenches, writer, producer, frontman, and friend, James Michael. Hello, James. What's up, Ryan? How are you? <laughs> Can you believe I wrote that intro in like uh, three minutes right before it was, we started the pod? It, it was brilliant. It, brilliant <laughs> intro. Nicely done. And it's just great to see you, man. How I, I love the fact that um, that really my professional career started with you many, many years ago. Um, I, I As you were just mentioning, I... Uh, I'd signed a record deal and put out my first solo record back in, I think it was 99, and you were the guitar player on that record because of our, our mutual friend, Michael Pavlik. Um, yes. Michael and Pavlik was, a, just to give some people a little bit of a backstory, he was the first drummer that I ever played music with. We grew up in Northern California. In fact, this is so much going back to get forward. I think we need some animation for it. What do you say, Vic? We have to start with that. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> diving right in going back to get forward a little backstory on mike pavlik the guy that brought us together first drummer I ever played with in a band called starfire and you brought him into your project and you had a few projects in the bay area Right. Yeah, I remember Lost. Was it Lost Americans? Uh, we had a band Last called Americans. The Last Americans, which was kind of a uh, like a Black Crow style heavy rock band. Um, and yeah, Michael was was my drummer for a lot of different projects that we did, and um, and for a, a long period of time was my brother in law. Um, so right. it, it's a it was all it was a family affair for quite some time. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I just I remember. Um, because at the time you were already doing some really cool things in the, in the music industry. And I was just kind of starting to, to, to dip my toe in the industry with, with this record deal. And I was just so, so thrilled that you came and, and put your imprint all over that record because what, what I was, you know, I was trying to do all of the instruments myself and just kind of build it up the way I do it now. But I just didn't have the guitar skills that that I needed to to create that that album the way I wanted it to sound. And the thing I always loved about the way that you played is that as soon as you picked up a guitar and started playing, 
whatever it was you were playing, it sounded like the radio to me. It just always, wow, that's, that I've always thought of, of when I think of your sound, your tone, and every guitar player has their own specific tone, but you just always exemplified that radio sound. And that's what I was so thrilled to have you all over that record because- You exemplified really, a radio head sound as well, because I know that <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. right around the time of the bends. And yeah. uh, and we were we were definitely digging on Radiohead, so there was a lot of uh, vibrato guitar. I remember yeah. the parts that we were doing, and and the thing that the I, it was in Alameda. I, I believe that's yeah. where we, we you had your home studio. The thing yeah. that you were so early on, which is you know obviously has helped you out throughout your entire career, is that this little program called Pro Tools, and you were like mastering it. At, at such an early stage, you were one of those early guys that just really got in. I don't know. Would you read the manual? <laughs> Dude, get- I, I actually, that's a great question. And, and I was, it was that technology was so new at that time, as, as you just pointed out. And I remember um, I had had a session with in that same studio in my little home studio in Alameda, um, probably only a couple of months before I worked with you. And I, I had been hired to record a, um, to edit and record a, a string section for this band. And I literally, it was my first experience with Pro Tools. And so here's how I set it up. I don't know if you remember, but I had my, my studio set up in one bedroom and then down the hall was, my, was the bedroom that I slept in. And I that had- was studio. Right, exactly. And then I had I had the Pro Tools manual sitting on the bed in my bedroom. And I remember just I was under so much pressure because I literally didn't know what I was doing. And they'd be like, hey, can you can you take this little section of this song and just move it over here and we can try listening to it that way? And I'd be uh, yeah, hold on for just a second. I have to go to the bathroom. And I'd run down the hall and I'd flip through the instruction manual of Pro Tools, oh, how to how to cut and paste audio. And then I'd I'd think I'd figured out and then I'd run back down the hall and I'd try it and it would either work. I'd be like, uh, I'm thirsty. Can you, do you mind if I get a glass of water? I'd run back down the hall. And it, it was the most stressful recording session I've ever done in my life because I literally didn't know what I was doing. So by the time you came in to record, at least I had a some somewhat knowledge of how Pro Tools work. Cut and, and paste. Was, yeah, of course. <laughs> at least but, that part. That is definitely editing on the fly. Oh you know? my God. It was <laughs> so stressful. Reminds me of the episode of uh, Brady Bunch where Peter Brady has to go into different rooms to satisfy two of the girls that he's having. <laughs> it's actually nothing like it, but I like to put in a Brady Bunch reference whenever you got I can in the podcast. Right. Oh man. So anyhow, um, this, uh, you know, a fascination with technology, which has helped you so much. What, got you into the fascination with music because i never asked you where you grew up in were you a bay area guy as well or no i look at that <laughs> look at that rock star right there my goodness um you know i um when i was about 13 or 14 um my brother came home my brother who was three years older than me came home with um the picture disc for uh meatloaf bat out of hell and uh and we we put that on and i remember watching first off watching my brother's reaction to it and just how it just completely captured his imagination and it just transported him and i was like I want to I want to be able to to tr- transport people like that because whatever I'm seeing music do to my brother I want to be able to do to other people. So that was the first time where I thought there might be something here for me. Um, and of course, I was so drawn to just the drama and the theatrics of, of Meatloaf's Bad Out of Hell. It was such a such a over the top album. Um, and I think that that really shaped my initial concept of how music should be experienced so i was always drawn to the to the overly dramatic and the, and the theatric uh, part of it so and, and then uh, all those years later comes full circle you end up working with meatloaf you end up producing uh yeah you know, did you produ- now what what how was that whole experience working with meatloaf knowing that he was kind of like the genesis for you to start the music in the music business he was he he became a, a a very very dear friend of mine uh over the years and um I, in fact the, the very first show that i did in los angeles um with michael drumming um the very first show that i did in support of the inhale album 
Meatloaf came to that show and I remember it just hearing a buzz that he that Meatloaf was at this show. And then the next day I got a, a, a phone call from Meatloaf and, and which just shocked me. And he was like, hey, this is this is Meat. Um, I was at your show last night. Uh, and I made some notes. Um, would you be interested in, in hearing some suggestions? So he proceeded to to spend, well, he invited me out to his house and, and we had just a, a wonderful visit, but he literally took me through note by note of, of these different suggestions he had for my performance. So, and he was just always that way with me. He was always very generous and very loving and kind and um and supportive so yeah it's just it's so bizarre that that my my the beginning of my musical journey really did start with with that bad out of hell album and then the, the day that he invited me out to his house um I, you know i was completely nervous just be, I, of course it's meatloaf so i'm expecting you know to to be coming up to a to a a castle, yeah, you know, yeah. with with a moat around with it, and bats and motorcycles yeah, with, with, <laughs> flying over it. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so I, so when I got to his house, it was really, it was just kind of a, a a very nice but very basic colonial style house with a white picket fence. So so it wasn't at all what I imagined. <laughs> um, but uh, but he was just so gracious. And one of the first things he did, he walks me down this hallway, and at the end of the hallway is the original artwork for Bad Out of Hell, the the artwork that was on that picture disc and uh and wow. i remember he just walked me down to it and it was beautifully lit it was it seemed like it was in a gallery and i just stood there and just thought oh my gosh if my brother could be here right now he would just be so excited and and you know but i i i've just carried that that memory with me ever since it was just such a such a wonderful moment in, in what what turned out to be kind of the beginning stages of my career and you obviously kept in touch with him over the years because he did actually uh, ask you to help him with what was it was it bad out of hell three or we did um we did uh, a few albums together uh we did uh, an album called couldn't have said it better where uh, i wrote a, a few songs on that me and nikki six co-wrote a, a few songs for him on that um and then on uh there was another album where i i had this just very bizarre song called Las los angeluser um, and he just, for some reason, he just loved that song and, yeah. and, a, and asked me if, if I'd be okay with him doing a version of it. And he put it on one of his albums and, um, and actually just recently, like maybe six months ago, I was flipping through YouTube and a, an a amazing version of him singing that song live, uh, came up on YouTube. I'm like, Oh my God, I forgot he cut that song. So, so, and then we did work on, um, we, I did write for Bad Out of Hell 3, uh, which was right. produced by Desmond Child, who I believe you've had on your, on your podcast, yes, haven't you? Yeah. yeah. He's a love, love Desmond. He's amazing. Yeah, he's, he's such, a, he's such a, a, an amazing character. I've, I've learned so much from him over the years. But yeah, um, but yeah so I've been lucky enough to, to have um, quite a bit of, of involvement with Meatloaf over the years. And of course, we just we miss him so much. It's just crazy that he's gone. See, that's the beauty of this podcast is that, uh, you know, one minute we're talking about your upbringing and, you know, us in hey, uh, recording the Inhale album. And the next we spend some time, rightfully so, about Meatloaf because he was one of your very first idols. The one yeah. question I wanted to get was, where was that happening? Was it Northern Cal? Because I've never really asked you if you were from Northern Cal or where you grew up. Oh, yeah. Um, I grew up in, uh, in I was born in Michigan. Um, and my father, uh, who is an art professor and an artist, uh, he was he would he taught at a, at a college in Michigan, and then he would go and teach a semester over in in England. So as a as a child, I spent a lot of time going back and forth between England and and, and the states, primarily Michigan. Um, and then the it, Beatles haircut in the the first photo. Yeah, of, of course, there. absolutely. <laughs> going absolutely. across the pond, you had to right. have the Beatles haircut. And in fact, I had a I had a full on English accent when I was that age right there when I was a kid and and when I came back to the states the school systems here actually made me go to speech therapy to get rid of the accent can you believe that yeah and then all those years later we have to try and 
when those when inhale was coming out, didn't we try to feign a little bit of an oasis of, type of, of English accent in our own songs? <laughs> Absolutely. In fact, I was I was always hugely influenced by by British pop music, um, primarily because when I was a kid uh, and when I was living in England, um, we lived in a. Uh, in this artist's flat where, where everyone in this building was some type of artist, whether it was a visual artist or a musician. And we just happened to have above me, we had a, a classical pianist that would literally play practice eight hours a day. And below me was a French hornist that would do the same practice eight hours a day. So it was just this crazy mess of, of music all the time, just hearing all of these different, you know, artists practicing and then i had this little am fm style radio that i would just turn up as loud as i could just to drown out all of the the <laughs> noise going on around me and that's where i was introduced to gary newman the tubeway army and joe jackson and all of these these mm. you know artists that were so popular on british pop radio at the time so that's really where i started developing my taste for music and i think also developing my taste for production because i i was you know, I was when you when I look at the the type of productions I've done, you know, throughout my career, I've always tried to have as many things going on at one time in a, in a musical production as I can, always just pushing it right to that limit where it might almost be too much. And I think the reason was is because as a kid, when I was like turning up that radio to drown out the, the cacophony of sounds going on around me. That was how I listened to music. I listen, I, I, you know, so for me, a production is basically all of these kind of unrelated things going on, finding a way to make them all kind of yes. make sense. Yes. Yeah. And then, and then down the center of it is this pop song that's just trying to escape somehow. That's just trying to find its way through the, the, the mess of noise. That's how I've always approached uh, production and mixing is just trying to find that, that balance. And uh, so it makes sense to me that that's, that that that's how I listened to music as a kid was just it was a very crazy experience. You both, me and me both. I mean, raised on AM radio. I tell people that AM radio when we grew up was a little bit different than it is today. It wasn't just sports talk. It wasn't just right. political talk shows. It was actual, you know, Aerosmith next to the Bee Gees, next yeah. to the Commodores, next to Earth, Wind, and Fire. Then all of a sudden you have some cheap trick in there. That, that was yeah. for me growing up in the Bay Area with KFRC, AM yep. radio. But what was your first instrument? Because you have you play so many of them. What was the first one? My first instrument was drums. Um, and I, you know, I can play drums. I, I do well enough to play drums for recordings that I'm doing, but you wouldn't want me as a drummer in your band. I'm just not, I'm not that good. Um, and then I transitioned over to piano and I studied uh, classical piano for many, many years. Um, and then from there, I, um, you know, I started picking up the guitar and, uh, and the bass came pretty naturally to me. Um, so, you know, I've over the years, I've I've built out my my repertoire of, of instruments that I can play. But I'm 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 really only proficient on on guitar and piano. But but never anything where it's um, gone. Are you self-taught with guitar or did you actually have lessons as well? With that? I'm. I'm self-taught with guitar. Um, I did study piano classically for about, I think, eight years. And then I studied jazz. Uh, so I did have some training as far as that goes. Um, but, you know, I, I learned how to read music as a kid, um, but I never... I never got good at it because my ear was always so much stronger. I, my ear would tell me how to play something long before the sheet music would tell me how to play that mm -hmm. same thing. And so, so that was kind of the direction that I went. So I, I, I am classically trained, but for instance, if you were to put a piece of complicated sheet music in front of me today, I'd be lost. I, I would not know where to begin. And do you even need a piece of, you know, complicated sheet music these days, because it seems like so much is about your ear training as a, as a working musician. That's a really good question. That's a really good question. And, and I, I just had an experience very recently. Um, my, my good friend and, and, and my vocal coach, Melissa Harding, uh, was, was recording, um, a, uh, a, a demo reel with a, with a full kind of, I think, 
10 piece band. Um, and she, she hired me to come in and record it for her. And so we were in this rehearsal studio and she had a, a fantastic musical director and he put together this entire band of, of professional sheet reading musicians. And it was one of my first experiences actually being in a room with that many musicians who had never met each other, never played together. They were able to just sit down and, and go from, for instance, bar five and go through bar 23 and play it perfectly time after time. And I just thought, man, if if rock bands could could do this, <laughs> the, the, the entire production process would be so different. And maybe in some ways more enjoyable as a producer because boy it sure was nice to just you know be able to say okay let's go from bar 100 to bar 250 and and then we'll nail stop it. and and just nail that and have it done perfectly every single time was a it was a really fun experience the only other time i experienced something similar to that was when i was producing the uh, scorpions record uh, with desmond child actually we did a we did a record together and at one point we hired um an orchestra to come in and and uh we had david campbell conducting which is just a fantastic experience but i got to experience some of that same level of just precision when it comes to to sight reading music because you know we had a 60 piece orchestra in the studio and every single one of those musicians was was dialed in just like i was explaining and and um it's a fun experience it's a very different experience than than what you and i are probably used to when used we go to into in a studio yeah yeah, yeah. And I think for certain instruments, uh, sight reading is still a major, major part of, you know, the process. And you have to, you have to learn that language. You have yeah. to know your notes. Um, it's, it, we have this thing called um, basically hot topic. And um, you've been mentioning a lot uh, about your vocal coach. And um, there it is, hot topics. There you go, Erwin. Hot. Ingrid. It's hot. Hot, hot right? topics. Um, and one of our first hot topics, because what we do is we'll take uh, headlines that are from Blabbermouth or Brave Words or Spin or some sort of publication. Um, there's been a lot of talk lately about talent or technique. Mm -hmm. And because you mentioned Melissa Harding, I, I thought she would be kind of a good person to uh, – have on the show and sort of give us a little bit of insight. So without you even really knowing it, uh, please welcome Melissa Harding to oh, the In yeah. the Trenches podcast. There, <laughs> there she, she is. is. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Ryan. How are you? Hello, Melissa. How are so you doing? good to see you. I have met you one time many, many years ago on the uh, Alice Cooper bus. I don't know if you remember. Oh, okay. Well, oh, this this was a great. This one. is a great story. <laughs> hi, James. Out. Hey, hi, hey. it starts so, out with me backtracking. Well, okay, well, on the bus. <laughs> No, where where it ends is is we we all were, were downtown in this city. We were all playing a festival together, and we were downtown in the city. And somehow we didn't have a way back. And and we ran into you, and you're like, well, why don't you just hop on the bus? We're heading over to the to the yeah. festival now. And we get on this bus, and first off, we have we have the shittiest bus on the planet for our Worst tour. Bus. Now, let's give a little backtrack. Let's give a little backstory. Was this on the Motley Crue tour, or was this on the six a.m. when we were? This was. This was festivals. It was 6 a.m. doing festivals. Okay, and we, were, and we were over in Europe somewhere. And I can't okay, remember. Now, now it's to come clear. Somewhere okay. around 2016, 17, yeah. around that era. Yep. And yeah. just for you, for you guys know that Melissa is actually works with uh, James, a vocal technique, vocal coaching. Yep. But she's also uh, toured with 6 a.m. Uh, yeah. for uh, a lot of those, a lot of those years. So they've been together in the band. They're bandmates as as well as a teacher student. And yeah, that's um, right. So when we actually we started off, I was her teacher. Uh, yeah. I met her when I was I was vocal directing a, a children's theater group up in the Bay Area. Actually, oh my gosh, there oh, it is. Man. That's <laughs> that's me and Melinda right there. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's so good. It's so good. I'm like 13, I think, in that photo. And uh, yeah, we've known each other since I was 11 years old. So 20, 25 years. Crazy. So I remember. So so it was we were doing this festival. We were all you you were very, very kindly invited us to ride on your bus back to the festival. And I remember we all got on it and 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 you were you were literally like cutting apples and cheese and making you were, hors you were cutting for us. avocado. I remember yeah. you oh, were God. like. 
Definitely you avocado. You kicking an avocado, I, and I was like, oh, this bus <laughs> is amazing. Like, I want the avocado. I want to live here. <laughs> yeah. Everybody else on the bus is sick of my avocado farm uh, <laughs> because, honestly, in, you guys know about riders, and everybody that's listening right now probably knows that, you know, about Van Halen's No Green M&Ms. Well, the one thing that I have on my rider is an avocado. But it's not like I eat an avocado every single day. So like a week into the tour, there's like, you know, five or six avocados. Two weeks into the tour, there's about 13, you know, three weeks into the tour. So by the end of the tour, and you know how long avocados last. There's only a time space for them, uh, you know, a very nice, perfect uh, sort of time. To eat there's a avocado. very small window, a the very small, small window for yeah. an avocado. <laughs> so that I think so that, funny. so I, I, I I don't know. I, the avocado, everybody else on the bus is kind of like, Roxy, can you can you deal with the avocado farm sometime at one point? Either eat them or just going out. So I was you were doing me a favor by serving avocados because I had to uh, get rid of them somehow. We were we were <laughs> so jealous because, like I said, we had this this just absolutely awful bus we called it the blue waffle and if you and i mean don't google that folks yeah i was just gonna say google blue waffle don't do it don't google it because it's 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 traumatic but um but anyway (laughs) so i remember just all of us just sitting on your bus and just kind of sinking into these super comfortable couches and just going this is the life this guy lives the life why can't we have this type of experience and ours ours was just so opposite of that (laughs) i'm telling you if you like to play golf and you like to play rock and roll, and you like to play poker, if that's the trifecta of what you like to do, uh, Alice Cooper Band is the perfect band for you. Oh, man. <laughs> hey, that's right. So you're, you're actually a, a pretty accomplished golfer now, right? I, you know what? For me to say pretty accomplished means that I'm under 100. And that's like okay. 90% of golfers are not. So What's your, what's I, your handicap? I, okay. Am I gonna, really going to brag? If I, if I take out the app, if I take out the app, <laughs> I am currently a 16.4, okay. which, is, which right. is like a bogey golfer. Yeah, you're, you're fine with it. Because yeah, you're having an enjoyable game of golf at that point. I got and, down to a nine. I got down to a nine handicap, and I and I hated every minute of it. I was so miserable all the time because it was it, it, it's, it's a, a lot, lot of stress. It's a lot of frustration, and you know, I just reached a point where I gave it up completely because I thought to myself, "I'm coming home so angry every day from the golf course <laughs> that this, this can't possibly be why I should why I'm playing golf." I went with you once or twice, and I started getting angry too. And I was like, "I don't even care about this. Why am I mad?" You know, no, we, we play we play good guy golf every day with Alice. It's, it's like a practice round, he says. So, you know, you you hit two off the tee. Sometimes you get a rock star mulligan. You know, there, there's a lot of rules that we play with, with on, when we're on tour. But when yeah, I come back yeah. here and play in Sweden, it's they're sticklers for the rules. So, you ha- so oh, I yeah, so I have kept a I have kept an honest, really strict handicap on my app so that, you know, when I do play, I can get an okay score yeah, using yeah. my handicap and, and I can feel good about it. So I, I feel that it's 16.4. I'm doing good. I was just in LA last week and uh, was able to play a few rounds. I played with Mike Inez from Allison Chains, our good buddy, Mike Duda from Wasp. And uh, of course, Paul Blazik, you all know him on the podcast from being on and just being crazy, but yeah, we had a great round then. So that it's, so golf is one of those things I think not a lot of people talk about. Uh, in rock and roll, but I'm glad that you uh, have played it. Maybe we'll get you back into it next time we I, see you out there. I'd love to. I'd, I'd love to. I just, you know, I do. I do miss it, and I've just started watching it again recently on TV, and and I'm able to fight off those angry feelings. Angry. So who knows? Yeah, <laughs> may, maybe at some point I'll give it a go. Well, that, <laughs> folks um, that are just tuning in right now, this is not a golf podcast. This no, is a, a, a music podcast. We have uh, James Michael front man of 6am plus his own solo stuff and so much more writer producer a uh, friend i said and as well another friend melissa harding who is uh, works with james uh, they work together with james's voice and they played together in 6am and the hot topic was not golf the hot topic that i wanted to bring up again hot topic Vic. there you go i love it right <laughs> on cue is talent or technique mm-hmm. so um what what do you think is the key for a singer? Is 
is it more important to have talent or is it more important to have technique? And Melissa, I'll let you off uh, start with this answer. Oh, this is a this is an interesting question. And to be honest, I believe it's both, you know, and I think James is actually a great example of that because he is somebody that has said for many years, like, I don't even consider myself a singer, but we all know he's a fantastic lead vocalist and has such an emotional voice for him, especially the last time we went on tour, I think he realized like, oh yeah, I have the talent, but I need some of the technique in order to, to do this every day, multiple times. Yeah, exactly. For it to be a reliable instrument, especially, I just want to say singing 6am songs. I mean, you wrote those songs with no intention of really touring them live. So there was this other added pressure of like, oh, they want to hear these songs and they want me to sound like I sound on these records. And that's a hard thing to recreate emotionally every night. So when singers go on tour, it's a different thing than playing guitar. And, you know, a lot of singers don't have a tech, you know, they're on their own. And, yeah, and that yeah. was sort of where I could help him just just understand his instrument better so that he yeah. could go on stage and use it. And James, you can you can talk about that in more detail, what it was like yeah. for you. Well, I, th- I think that you're right. I, I would lean towards the the talent side of 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 that question as far as um, as what it's going to require for you to have success in the business. You, you've got to have something that feels like talent, that feels natural. Um, yes. But then to your point, Melissa, and this is where I, you know, for years I was able to do really whatever I wanted in the studio because I, I had, the, I controlled the environment. I could, I could, you know, try to, I could sing something a hundred times until I get it exactly the way I want it. Um, but when you're in a live situation, obviously you've got one, one chance to do it and, and you don't get a redo. Um, that's when I, you know, so when I started touring with 6am, that's when I realized, oh man, I need some technique to support this because otherwise I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna be terrified every night I step out on stage. So that's where, you know, working with Melissa came in because what she did was, she helped support the the natural skill set that I had. She helped support that and create a foundation that was that would become very reliable, that would become repeatable. What what you're looking for is just it's just like with golf, right? It, it's you're looking for something that's repeatable, whether it's a repeatable swing, whether it's a repeatable right. vocal performance. And uh that's where that's where developing the technique really, really matters. But I, I think to, to bring it back to the question. If I if I had to pick between technique and, and talent, I'd go with talent. Uh, just because you can you can get by on talent alone, um, but you you can't get by just on technique. Uh, I I don't believe. And there's a lot of singers I think that they figure that out because you think about it. There's so many artists out there. They've never had a voice lesson. They just started doing it. They just figured right. it out. You know. Um, I was listening to, to John Legend talk on a podcast recently and he was saying, oh yeah, like in my career, I realized later, oh, I need some help, you know, because our voices age, you know, our bodies age. We just need to be able to take care of it. But I agree with you, James. I believe that the talent's first, you know, it's always first. I think your, your point about the age is, is one that I am now starting to realize, okay, this, this really does matter. You know, there are times like. I talk with Melissa almost every day uh, and usually it's, I've got questions about what's going on with my voice. And there are times now where I, I you know, I run up against a, a challenge of some kind and we kind of exhaust all other possibilities. And then, well, then there's the chance that it, this might just be an age thing. You know, you might just be experiencing a different, you know, a different uh, body characteristic that just didn't exist a year ago. And, and that's a real thing. But when was that age that you actually figured out that, hey, I'm a pretty good singer. I'm going to use this. Maybe not during the bowl cut era. Maybe not during, you know, going back and forth between England and the States. But when was that age where you said, you know what? Because confidence does play a role in it as well. So what when, what was that, that sort of uh, light bulb moment where you say, you know what? I'm going to actually front this and I can sing uh, well enough. Because nobody ever sings thinks they sing well enough except those you know yeah. very very upper echelon singers even to yeah. this day alice tells me he goes you know i'm not a great singer but i'm an excellent performer 
even mm, though yeah. he's got his character voice, when yeah. you hear his voice it's immediately distinguishable and he's a, got a great voice listen to some of those amazing you know ballads those iconic ballads no one you know only women bleed it's like alice's voice is you know just alice so yeah. what was that that moment for you where you said you know what i'm going to be a front man you know, I think um, the first time I felt that was when we made the Inhale record. Um, I I loved the I loved the lyrics on that record so much. Um, I was not as happy with where my voice was at that time. I was just starting to shape the sound of my voice, and um, and I, in fact, I remember one review that I got. My favorite review I ever got of that album was this journalist said. Um, his first off, it was not a, a positive review. He was he was quite a, he was quite upset with me for even making the record in the first place. But uh, <laughs> but he um, he said James's voice is like an annoying combination of Adam Duritz, which which I thought okay, Adam Duritz, I love the Counting Crows, and Weird Al Yankovic was the second was the second oh, no. vocalist. And I just I remember reading that and thinking. Well, this can't be a compliment. I, I mean, even though I love Adam Duritz, but uh, and I but, love Weird Al. Who yeah, doesn't, love, Weird Al? Who doesn't love a good Weird Al song? I've uh, actually played Albuquerque on stage with him. So, you know, <laughs> really? I, isn't there? Isn't there like a, a, a new biopic coming out with? Uh, I think yes. Sh is Shia LaBeouf playing him or something? No, Harry Potter is playing him. Oh, Harry Potter's Daniel playing Radcliffe Weird Al is paying him. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> but anyways, to answer your question, I think that right around the inhale time is when i started going okay if i work on this some more i can shape my voice to to have that kind of like what i was talking about with you and your guitar tone to have that radio sound you know that was just something that i was always searching for and and with a voice like mine that is that is i don't believe my voice is very distinctive it's i'm, I'm more like a chameleon i can i can sing you know heavy blues stuff i can sing pop stuff i can sing Power rock ballad. stuff yeah. which which seems like a great thing to have that type of versatility but when you're trying to be an artist that has a distinguishable sound uh it becomes a little bit more challenging and i don't think i really tapped into that sound until um until making the first 6 a.m record the heroin diary soundtrack that's when i that's when I kind of went, okay, I'm figure I figured out how to how to record my voice. I figured out the right type of microphone to use. I figured out the right type of of um, tone to create, the right type of compression. I started honing in on my sound and then spent the next decade just continuing to hone that. So uh, so I think the first time I, th I thought about it was probably during Inhale. And then it wasn't until we did the first 6 a.m. record that I really started going, OK, I could be a singer. I could I could do this. Well, I invite everybody to come and uh, listen to Inhale after watching this podcast, of course. Uh, find it. There's uh, YouTube videos. It's on YouTube. It's on Spotify. Uh, it's where James and I first collaborated on, on our album, and I'm still really happy with that album. Every time I listen to it, I put it on from time to time. Um, you had mentioned... Uh, who, it was Joe Jackson because yeah. uh, as one of your uh, sort of influences early on and James does an amazing cover of, is she really going out with him on that album? I believe, was it that album? It, it was on that album. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, while you're doing that, while, while you're still listening to our podcast, we're going to take a really short break right now. Um, it's going to, I want you to put up Vic if you can. Vic, our producer, has been great all day putting up all these lovely shots of uh, James um, and Melissa. And there were some good shots of you too, Melissa. I don't know if you saw those <laughs> earlier. Yeah. And um, he's, do he's doing all the cuts. And uh, Federica, we got to give a big shout out to her as well because she's helped out very much with the script. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about System 12, the guitar lesson. Um, I'm not going to talk about it. I'm going to actually play, run the commercial if you can, Vic. Give me a thumbs up if you got it lined up. And um, we'll come right back with uh, Melissa Harding and our special guest, James Michael. We'll talk about the new single that he has coming out called California Smile. But uh, if you're listening and you want to uh, check out and you're inspired to play music and learn music, especially guitar, maybe this might interest you right now. So check it out. We'll be right back. Hello, Ryan Roxy here from the Alice Cooper Band, and I'd like to talk a little bit about one of my favorite things, playing guitar. 
Here at the RGA headquarters, which stands for Roxy Guitar Army, by the way, we put together a guitar learning system that will get you playing and understanding the guitar faster than any other teaching program out there. We call it the System 12 Guitar Method. And it's designed to make the most out of your time, your effort, and your passion for learning guitar. By combining new school technology, old school mentoring, and the number 12, we have invented a new way to teach guitar. And over the past year, we have helped so many people who wanted to start or continue their guitar journey do exactly that. Now, we'd like to help you. There's never been a better time to start learning guitar than right now. If you think it's too hard, the System 12 makes it easy. If you think it'll take too much time, the System 12 will have you playing in 12 weeks. And if you think it's too expensive, the entire System 12 costs less than what one private guitar lesson would cost you at your local music store. Check out the official site or the links below in the description of this video to join the RGA and get started on your guitar journey with the System 12 guitar method. Now, let's get back into the trenches for some more rock and roll. Enjoy the show. Enjoy the ride. Mwah! That's it. See, that's what I look like without reading glasses and a little bit of eye makeup. <laughs> there you go. But here, hey. James Michael and Melissa Harding. Uh, you know, we're talking about uh, hot topics, and uh, there was a question. Um, I am so bummed out because we have a, a thing called Let the People Speak that I put out for people that would ask uh, James questions. And, of course, on Instagram, uh, it disappeared before I had a chance to write down all the questions. Mm -hmm. It just disappeared. I thought you could always go back to it and uh, refresh it and, and go get those questions. So there was an, well, like I said, an overwhelming uh, amount of questions concerned wow. one thing, which we'll talk a little bit about, but there was also one question that snuck through and there was a question for um, about the typical warm-up vocal routine because we just talked about system 12 learning guitar now we're talking to some vocal experts right here on the podcast again if you're just joining us uh, hit that subscribe button hit that like button right now it helps us with the algorithm and gets more eyeballs on our podcast this is the in the trenches podcast by the way and um, if you're not listening to us live i hope you could be because then that's where the live chat is at and we love having you there in the live chat putting up all these amazing comments but one of the questions that snuck through was what is the typical warm-up vocal routine and how much time do you spend warming up before a show and this is a good question for both of you i don't know who wants to take it first Melissa, why don't you take why don't you take it first? Yeah, well, I want to say just a quick note to anyone listening that, you know, not all voice teachers are alike. Right. So in terms of the coaching and the training, technique can be very different and warm ups can be very different based on the style you're singing. So uh, for me personally, as a vocal coach working with James, He's a rock vocalist. So, you know, he's going to do a lot of work on stage. Um, a lot of singers over warm up, actually. They warm up too much. They don't quite understand what the purpose of the warm up is. And warming up is to get your muscles moving. But vocalizing is actually different. Like James and I do a lot of vocalizing, which is strength training. That That's not just warm ups. A lot of them are warm ups, but they're actually trying to strengthen the muscle for what he's going to go do on stage. Um, but I would say, James, for a typical show, wouldn't you say our typical warm up was about 15 to 20 minutes? We would take breaks in between. We would do that's one of the main things about the voice. And this is a funny thing I always tell rock singers. But like if I was a soccer player and my voice was tired, would I would or like my leg was hurt? Would I pound on my leg? Right. And singers do that to their voices. Their voices get tired. They get scared. So they start testing their voice as yeah, opposed yeah. to warming it up and actually understanding. And that was the thing James, I think, has really learned in the last like decade working on it. It's like, oh, wait, I actually have to do things for this muscle so that it can go on stage and do what it needs to do. But I'd say 15 to 20 minutes. If you're going to play a two hour set, you should not be warming up more than 15 minutes. Maybe. Yeah, yeah I think I think that's right. And I think that that. Um equally as important, if not more important, is the warm down. And that's something yes. that, that, that a lot of singers um, probably don't pay enough attention to um, because what the warm down does is it sets you up for the next day. And that next day, you know, 
when you're on tour, it's those days are very kind of cut and paste, repeat. You know, uh, you're usually doing uh, very early morning radio shows where maybe you have a performance to do first thing in the morning, and you know it's tough to to, to be in a, a radio station at five thirty in the morning and have to do an acoustic you know vocal of of a song. Um, so so warm downs are except are extremely important to get you set up for the next day but you know to melissa's point yeah i think normally about 15 minutes it just depends on where your voice is on that day and mm -hmm. what what ch what challenges you know you're going to face and that's how you'll kind of shape your warm up there are days where where it just where uh, 15 minutes just isn't going to be enough because for some reason um, your vocal cords are just, they're not feeling familiar to you yet. And you never want to step out on stage without being very familiar with where your body is, where your, where your cords are and what they're capable of doing. So, uh, so you, you do have to kind of customize your warm up based on what your day has been like and what your set is going to be like. Um, but yeah, 15 minutes is, is a good, safe amount of time. And to her point, you don't want to go too much because then you're just exhausting yourself. Well, I'm very, very curious about this warm down because the, the warm down for me is usually a vodka and soda. <laughs> and, and we sing a lot in the Alice Cooper band. So I know that that's probably not a very uh, healthy warm down. Um, it, tell us about, is it scales or is it breathing exercises or is it a combination of both? For the warm down specifically, and again, a lot of my training, just for anyone listening, my background was in classical voice and musical theater first. So I know all that technique, but rock technique's a bit different, right? Because we are singers that use tension. It's like, you know, when Alice Cooper goes on stage, part of what makes that voice so cool That's is right. this natural, yeah. yeah, natural way of using strength and there's natural grit and tension. But just quickly to explain that, that involves your tongue and your jaw and a lot of these muscle mechanisms of the voice having to do things. So we want to let go of that stuff. If any athletes heard like lactic acid builds up in your muscles, it's true for the voice as well. So we want to let go of it. So the specific warm down that I teach and work with my singers is it involves holding the tongue. It involves disengaging the tongue and asking the vocal cords to come together in a really simple way. So James goes on stage and does all these massive songs. We want to remind the vocal cords what it was like when we were not doing massive things. When we were in rest mode, we bring it back down to center. We bring it back to neutral. So if you warm up your voice to a three, you sing to a 10, and then you drink your vodka, right? <laughs> then you're not quite getting back to zero for the next day. So we want to warm back down to a five so that when we sleep, we're kind of back to zero for the next day. And then your voice is starting in a healthy position. That's kind and of that's the really, quickest it, answer. It's that's so a really important. great way of explaining it. Yeah. You know, I, I think that a lot of people, um, a, a good way to, to explain you know the the importance of vocal health is when you're a guitar player as you know you have your you know very very precious guitars that you love and and that you just you treat like gold yes. and you you go out and you do a show and then but right off stage there's a uh, an anvil case ready to house that guitar so as soon as you're done playing it gets wiped down it gets put back in a safe place it gets locked up and it's pr very well protected until the next performance but as a vocalist your instrument goes with you and then and then you can go have your vodka and do all of that stuff but as as a as a vocalist, you're carrying that instrument around with you everywhere you go. So if you go out to a club after a show and you're having to talk over loud music and and, and loud, you know, ambient noise, your your instrument is just continuing to get beat up and beat up and beat up. So by the time you go to do the show the next day, you're not pulling it out of a case. It's it's just been it's been terrorized, you know, the, the entire <laughs> night before. So so there are a lot of things to consider. So so being a singer is very, very different than being a guitar player or a drummer or any other, you know, musician in a band. Speaking about carrying around things, it's a shameless plug, by the way. This is the new guitar that just Ooh. came in, folks. So Dude, look at that. Rock and Roll Relics. Billy Rowe has done it again. I thought I'd debut it. This is going to be... Uh, yeah, it's a very 
cool jet pink is the color that they're calling it. And uh, there it is. Oh, that's the awesome. good people over at Rock and Roll Relics. I just had to do it because you're talking about a guitar player just taking it with you. And I know. Honestly, <laughs> I, I debuted it. There it is, folks. A whole bunch of stuff coming out on this guitar really soon. But that's um, amazing. Hey, really cool. can I can I actually do something similar? And I think you're gonna have a Please great do. appreciation for this. Go get it. The, you you are the reason that I got my very first guitar and you actually set, set me up with the company that custom made this guitar. So hold on, I'm pulling there these out. There you go. It's, it's guitar <laughs> show and tell. <laughs> Melissa, do you have I, your guitar? This is from the I, I do. This <laughs> oh, GMP Roxy the, model. Uh, the guitar that I think you might've even played this on the inhale record as well. Yeah. Um, oh my gosh, I love that. you set me up with this company. Yep. Let me that's put my GMP Roxy I model. I love that's that guitar. Yep. That's, that's yes. a Roxy model. That's, it's a Roxy model, and um, I still have a revenge. couple of them. That's a Revenge. This one's a Revenge. That one's a Roxy. Melissa, oh, where's yours? Yeah. <laughs> mine, mine is a, a very old Takamine. Oh, man, that looks <laughs> nice. I bet you plenty of songs. Plenty of songs have been written on that guitar. Exactly. Exactly. I love it. <laughs> exactly. Well, here we go. Another hot topic. Now, this is the big one now. And before before uh, I let you go, Melissa, and we start talking about James's new single, California Smile, which is where we're all, we have another hot topics. And this <laughs> one is to BT or not to BT. All right. And the BT stands for backing tracks. Ooh. Oh, so now this is a lot of things because, and this is very important. How do you guys feel about because I know that James was very early, even before all this, uh, before Pro Tools was lined up with everything, before everyone, you were very early with using tracks that, that supported the song. And yeah. I don't know how you did it back in those days. I think it was like done with like DAT, DAT machines yeah, or yeah. all that kind of stuff. But how do you guys feel about backing tracks, especially the fact that Melissa, you've toured with 6AM as a background vocalist. Mm -hmm. And and so there is a lot of live music going on, but there's also uh, BTs going on. It's just a part of life. It's just a part yep. of technology. It's just a part of what bands, and to be honest with you, fans are used to hearing now. Yeah. Um, yeah. How did it start for you, James? Because I, I, I do remember you, I'm, you know, I'm thinking you're going to be backing the backing track uh, sort of, way only because you've used them for so many years i yeah i i support it um but i i have some you know i have some some limitations on on where i support it and where i don't uh number one you know as as you just said a lot of bands are using it whether you're a pop band or a rock band or a country band a lot of bands use tracks and i have no problem with people using tracks to um, to give the the audience the best possible musical experience they can have, um, when to use tracks and when not to use tracks, never use tracks on a lead vocal. And and I know some artists that are out there using tracks on their lead vocal, and and I just wouldn't want to be in that position. Um, I, I think that you know, I think that if you're having to use tracks on your lead vocal you have bigger issues to deal with and, 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 and you should, and you should figure that stuff out before you go out and try to entertain people. Um, but, uh, but I, but as far as like, you know, to enhance some background vocals or to add like a keyboard part, if you're not touring with a keyboard player and you want to have some, some keyboard elements, I have no problem with that. It, 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 it enhances the sound and it makes the live performance better. Um, so that's kind of where where I draw the line. You just don't want to get into a situation where you're relying on it for for a lead vocal. And uh, for you, Melissa, as you know, as an experienced back up singer and, and actually touring with that, how does that how do the backing tracks work or work against what? You're yeah, I mean, with? you know, for 6 a.m., there's so many incredible vocal parts and there was just no possibility that with two of us backup singers, we would be able to handle all of them because there are so many different parts. Layers. And so, yeah. yeah. And so it was and, you know, just commenting on what James said for the lead vocal thing, you know, I think that also for example, like with Beyonce, sometimes she's dancing with 10 backup dancers. And I'm sure they're they're doubling those lead vocals because there's so much movement and it's so athletic. And any lead singer in that situation is also like, oh, 
if I get sick or something, now I'm having to kind of deal with this situation. But for the backing vocals, especially, we did as much as we could, especially with 6AM. There's a lot of theatrical operatic parts and all these other things we were doing. But I'm a huge fan of having, you know, the full sound of all those other parts that we we can't necessarily sing everything. You know, there's probably 50 vocals on some of these things. We did a lot of vocals on some of those records, you know. Yeah. So we we bring as much as we can live and it's really great to do that, you know. I, I think as more as as music evolves, live shows evolve and technology evolves, peop, fans themselves are expecting a higher level of, uh, I guess it would be perfection uh, in, yeah. in, in a performance. Whereas when I grew up, uh, I was lucky enough if I heard the lead vocal going to concerts, I was lucky if I could hear the lead vocal above the rumble of, of like 10 SVT Ampeg bass cabinets, right, you know? Right. So the sound, the sound, you know, that has, that they've improved upon so much with live performance has also forced the artist to, uh, you know, rely on techniques that can actually get a better sound as well. I know that uh, our, our good friends over at Brave Words, Loudwire, and I think it was Metal Tracks, um, Dave Mustaine thinks bands, uh, they shouldn't do it. Rely on backing tracks are fucking lazy. But I mean, are they lazy or are they using technology to their advantage? You know, right. you, you know, I, 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 that's a good question. And, you know, I understand where he's coming from. And, and also, I think that probably in his genre, there is a, you know, there is a purist uh, sensibility that, that would that would not allow you to support backing tracks, nor nor would I, you know, if I was watching a, a Megadeth show, Number one, they don't need backing tracks. But number one, it's it's not the kind of music where you'd really benefit from it anyway. You know, whereas if you're doing something um, more pop oriented or something that had a big string section, then it might make sense. So, you know, I don't I don't disagree with him that there is an an element of laziness to some bands that just do it no matter you know before they've even gone in to see what they sound like in a rehearsal studio without it they're just jumping to it uh, you know I I understand both sides of that but I think to his point you know maybe try first without it and see how far you can get because you may end up only doing having a couple things on backing tracks rather than half of the production sound you know you may you may be able to whittle that down and even even do some songs without it and boy when you're when you're performing with backing tracks and then all of a sudden you perform without them it's such a freeing experience because you're not locked into that click track you're not you're not locked into the entire production element anymore and you can just kind of go wherever the 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 tempo takes you and it's a it's a really freeing experience i feel you should be able to play a rock show with your laptops or without your laptops. And, yeah. and, and it might be a different experience, but it should still be just as powerful a performance. And there yeah. you go. There's a, I, I, I did hear about this story <laughs> that Falling in Reverse canceled the show due to missing laptops. I don't think that that was because of all their Instagram accounts were lost in their laptops. I think it had a little bit more to do with, they all use, you know, they rely on it too much. I think if you rely yeah. on it too much as a crutch, it becomes a curse. I, I agree with that. And, and you don't want to find yourself in that position. You know, we have we've been out on stage before where uh, where things went wrong with the with the backing tracks. Everybody and that can, has. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and that can be really uh, it can it can really set you back a bit. It can really make you want to go crawl under a rock. Um, and singers so use them because they get scared. You know, at some point, if you lose your voice on the road, I get why people add their vocals and stuff. But like James, you were adamant. He was adamant when we were on tour. I'm not doing that, yeah. you know, and, yeah, that, and, and that's the thing that builds strength too. You know what I mean? It's like it, yeah. you rely on it then and it's becomes a crutch. I will, yeah. I will tell you this. Uh, and, and, and this is hand on my heart. Alice Cooper has the worst uh, backing tracks of all time because none of it's <laughs> real. It's all our vocals are live. We have that, that, uh, that sort of fifth Beatle or sixth Beatle in Cheryl Cooper, who's behind the curtain sometimes singing background vocals when she's not dressed like a, a zombie of uh, Mademoiselle <laughs> Guillotine or, or whatever the character is at that on that particular tour, Nurse Rosetta. But she she helps out with our uh, as a as another uh, vocalist. 
Tommy, uh, our, you know, our guitar player, he's, he's a great vocalist. He, he's able to double a lot of stuff with what Alice sings so that they have a very powerful doubling voice. Chuck and I over on stage right are able to, you know, we played together for so long, we harmonize. So the vocals are all covered. What's, what we do use is a super 90s version <laughs> sampler where we need to have like a ghoulie scream before Alice gets his head cut off. <laughs> we need some, we need some storm like sort yeah. of sound, some sound effects. Yeah. And, and, and it, I, I honestly will tell you this, it has nothing to do with click track. It's our drum tech pressing this uh, sampler that's, you know, from the 1990s, 1980s. I love that. That's I awesome. love that. And that's, yeah, I mean, that, that it makes sense to do that. Of course, you got to have some special effects to, you know, the, 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 otherwise, otherwise the audience is only going to be getting half the experience. So I, I, I appreciate that. And I think, you know, I think that um, I just try not to judge people that do it. People, you know, I think that um, if you're, if you're, if you're just using it as a crutch, probably not a good thing, but boy, if you're just trying to give the audience the best show you can, then go for it. There you go. Great way to, great way to wrap up this whole section. Uh, Melissa Harding, I want to thank you very much for being our, uh, thank our, you. Special, our special secret weapon on this episode of in the <laughs> trenches. Um, where can people find out more about your vocal techniques and um, all that kind of stuff? Are yeah. you, is it websites, Instagram, what's the best yeah, way? Yeah, I'm here? on a, you can find me. I'm Melissa Harding music.com and uh, I'm on Instagram at Melissa Harding voice. And I'm always there teaching and talking about singing. So come find me. I would love to chat with you. Well, yeah. Thanks I, so I, much I for just want to, I, I want to add to that plug a little bit because, because uh, Melissa truly, truly did change my life as far as uh, being a vocalist. I, I, so I would not have been able to have the, the, career that I had with 6am if it wasn't for the support that she gave me vocally. Um, we do this, this fun little, uh, uh, monthly thing called the singer safe place, which is, uh, which, uh, you can go to Melissa's, uh, Website, socials yeah. and, 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 and learn about it, but it's a really cool thing where we just gather, you know, 10 or 20 singers and we just talk, we get, we all get on a zoom call and we just talk about the experience of being a singer. Sometimes it's about, you know, like I was, I was in the recording studio working on a song and I couldn't figure out whether I wanted to use a falsetto or a full voice on it. So I just brought it up in the, in the singer <laughs> safe place conversation. We all started talking about it and having these different ideas. And it's just a, a really cool place for people that are either singers themselves or interested in the singing process. Uh, it's so, you know, come and join us for those. It's, it's a really interesting behind the scenes conversation. I just love it. Every time we do it, I just love the conversation. I get off of those Zoom calls just going, wow, I can't wait to do the next one. Yeah. Well, thanks. Uh -huh. uh, that's cool. And that's at melissahardingmusic.com. Music. Yeah. And you can find yeah, me yeah. on Melissa Harding Voice on Instagram. I post about it. We have our singer safe place this Sunday, actually. I'm so excited. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for having me, Ryan. It's really great to see you. It's and, been great. Uh, thank you so much, Melissa. Yeah, thank you very much, Ashley, for that contribution to the podcast. Uh, we really appreciate you having on. And we'll probably have you on again sometime. Please. Right I would love it. Sound I would great? love it. I would love we'll it. See you, Melissa. Have Bye. a good one. There she goes. Well, that was cool. Thanks for bringing her on. Yeah, She's you did. Awesome. You guys talk every day, and you did not know she was coming on. I did not know. That's awesome. That's <laughs> I awesome. got again. We got to thank our, our production team for putting it all together. Federica uh, and Vic and everybody that's on the RGA team. They've helped out. They're they're but, really awesome, by the way. What a what a just great operation you have going here. It's it's full on legit and pro, and they're just awesome. Super easy to work with. Just, I, I got to thank the team that lit, that backlit me today. It's amazing. I'm, <laughs> I'm not yeah. in a normal studio. No, but they, they are. And everybody that's part of the, that's watching right now, I consider you guys part of the RGA. Um, I know there's some all accessors out there. And if you're an all accessor, you know who you are. Um, but guess what it's time for? I know it's late in the podcast, but uh, usually we have the main event a little bit earlier. But I think it's time now, Vic, if we run the main event, because that's what we're going to do. Are you ready? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the main event. And of course, the main event here with James Michael, uh, we are here to talk about the new single that you have mm. out, 
and you just released it in September, late September. So it's very, very new. There it is. It's called California Smile. Thank you very much, June C. Very much appreciate any contributions you guys have made um, to the podcast. We appreciate you guys watching as well. Um, James, let's talk about California Smile because um, how did the idea come about? When did it come about? And uh, what's happening with the new single? Yeah, well, thanks. It's, it's, um, I've just been having a blast. I, about uh, six or eight months ago, um, I decided to, I, just ba backing up a little bit, really from about 2017 on, I really withdrew from, from music. I, I did very few projects. Uh, 6 a.m. was on hiatus. And um, I spent very little time in the recording studio. And then just about six or eight months ago, I started really getting... Um, the urge to get back in the studio and start creating again. Um, and, and I knew that um, I, I, I wanted to just, I wanted to kind of control the next phase of my career or whatever my legacy may be, whatever music, you know, we're all creating music that we're going to leave behind once we go. And I, I started realizing the importance for me of shaping that a little bit more of, of being in control of, of what music is out there and what music that I'm remembered by. And that really inspired me to, to get back in the studio and start creating again and really draw on all of my influences, draw on all of the experiences that I had touring with 6AM and making 6AM records and all of the collaborations that I've done over the years. I've, I've, found a, a few songwriting partners that I just adore and, and love working with. I, I co-wrote California Smile with, uh, with Blair Daly and Alex Siganowski, who are both very, very talented writers. Um, and I've just been having a lot of fun creating music that I like, music that I want to hear without any regard for whether it is you know whether it would be on the radio or whether it's a hit or anything like that. I, I'm I'm just motivated by very different things now um, and enjoying the process a lot. So yeah, California Smile is my first single. Um, and I think that anyone that is a 6 a.m. fan will kind of listen to it and go, oh yeah, I can I can see the similarities. I can I can you see, see the, the evolution going. You can see the evolution. A, a lot of people recently have actually mentioned that it reminds them of the Inhale album, which I love because it's kind right. of coming full circle. And right, and I right, can right. see that. I can see that. You know, we talked about it earlier, but I've always had a very what I consider a, a, a British pop or a, or a European pop influence to the type of music that I write and produce. I think that that's what gave 6AM kind of a unique sound. I feel like a lot of 6AM choruses are, are very European in their, in their sensibility. And I, I don't know how to really put my finger on it other than I feel that there's just always been that, 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 that pop influence that I had as a, as a young kid listening to that AM radio in London, you know, international um, flair. Yeah. Because I, I remember yeah. there was some talk of retirement at one point yeah. and you had, had said, you know what, maybe I'm stepping back, but I'm glad to see that you dove forward to, yeah, to, I, to make I, this I, single. I am too. Uh, in in 2016, when 6 a.m. got off the road, we had had a, a pretty grueling couple of years. We we had made uh, two albums in a very, very short time. We did uh, Prayers for the Damned and Prayers for the Blessed. Uh, so being the producer and mixer of those albums, it was a lot of work to, to get those two albums written, recorded, produced, and mixed, and also be out touring with 6 a.m. So at the end of that tour... I remember the very last day uh, Nikki and I walked off stage and we both looked at each other and we were both exhausted. You could just, we could tell, you know, the, the, and, and I think we both said to each other, this may be the last time I ever step on stage. And at the time we really truly believed that, you know, at, at that um, point you needed prayers for James Michael. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Um, and then, you know, um, we, we, did take a hiatus from 6 a.m. and it was a much needed break and only just recently have I really been driven to be back in the studio creating and I'm just having the time of my life. Well that's the that's one of the questions that's coming up is California just a single release or is it part of something more? I've got a bunch more. I'm going to be releasing another song in about a month, maybe a month and a half. I got I got a ton more music. So, I'm super excited and and they're all just going to be singles. I mean, 
that's kind of the world we're in now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah I, I, I don't know. I mean, eventually it will be an album's worth of material, but they're just going to I'm just going to keep putting them out as singles. And like we were talking about before we jumped on the on the podcast, I'm just doing it independently. I, I chose not to do it with a record label. Um, I'm just putting it out myself. And while it's a it's a steep learning curve and i and i gained a real appreciation for a lot of the really brilliant people at re at the record label that 6am is on and you know a lot of people doing a lot of amazing work behind the scenes so when you're right. without that uh you realize just how much work was going on behind the scenes and how much i just took some of that for granted well now i know what the process is like well now you're I'm not only you're not only behind the glass you're in front of the glass you're you're in the office you're you're you know you're you're basically the ceo of james michael Incorporated. yeah yeah and, and and i and i love that and 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 we're so fortunate to have the fan bases that we have, you know, just, the, just your built. ability. Yeah. Then just like you with, with this podcast you're doing, you, you've, you've built the, you've built the ability to do what you're doing over a long period of time. And it feels good to, to be able to take advantage of that and give back, you know, that's literally why I am making music now is because 6am fans have been so devoted and so loyal to us over the years um and it just felt like to to just vanish you know in thin air and and not ever let them know how much i appreciate the support and the love that they've given um is that's that's the main reason that i decided to start putting music back out again i'm not i'm not trying to to be famous or 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 you know get a million spins or streams i don't really pay attention to that stuff anymore playing i'm out for your own legacy right now that's exactly right and and i just love the conversations that i engage with with fans and you know just i've i've gotten wonderful comments about california smile and i'm i'm just i'm having a lot of fun well, what is the best way to promote music in 2022? I mean, it, it, I, I feel that you're definitely on the right track. It's what I did with Imagine Your Reality. And by the way, I just real quickly have to say thank you, Jill. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, June. I see your guys' contributions for today's podcast. It's amazing. We Thank you very much for all that. Um, but yeah, I think singles that turn into an album. If you, yeah. if you can release, because that's what the way they did it way back in the day, back in yeah. the days when, you know, with the Beatles haircut and everything, it was singles became albums. And that's right. perhaps California Smile, you know, nine singles later could be some sort of album. Well, you know, that that's right. And I think that, um, you know, a, a friend of mine said, and, he, and he's really right about this. We're, we're no longer in the entertainment industry or the music business. We're in the attention business. We, we, <laughs> we are doing whatever we can to, to capture people's attention just for a short period of time, whether it's three and a half minutes for a song or whether it's an hour or so for a podcast. We're just trying to get people's attention. So, so the idea of making an album spending all of this time making an album not releasing music as you go but saving it all up and then releasing it as an album we have that kind of romantic fixation on what the album experience used to be like and it's a great experience i still love sitting down with a good album and listening from beginning to end on your headphones uh, absolutely yeah. but we're kidding ourselves if we think that people are going to give us that much attention now we just people don't have that much right. time in their day to give us that amount of attention so so I don't really have the desire to, to create albums anymore um, because it, it's just it's it, it would be in vain. You know, it, yeah. the, you're, you're never going to be able to control what that listening experience is like for somebody, no matter how much you'd like to. So I'm perfectly happy just putting out music and let, letting people discover it when they discover it and share it when they share it. That being said, you know, we're all trying to build our profiles. I'm, I'm trying to build my. Well, you asked how to promote music nowadays. We both know that if, you know, depending on who you ask, they're going to say, well, TikTok. TikTok is where you have to promote your music. That's where it's all happening. I understand that. I don't necessarily feel like TikTok is where 
music like I'm doing is necessarily exploding. It doesn't, it doesn't feel like a format that, that fits what I'm trying to do. I'm still, you know, I'm still trying to we're sliding into follow. the Instagram. I think we're, 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 we're barely on the upper echelon of, of acceptability with, with Instagram. I think yeah. fa Facebook is a little bit, a little bit older, senior, more crowd. That's okay. I can still post up there, but Instagram is where my flow is right now. I don't yeah. know what the next one's going to be. I just feel that TikTok right now for, even though I have a TikTok channel and yeah. thank you Federica for running it. Uh, I, I just feel that right now it's still, a little, hey, let the kids have that. Let the kids have that. It's really true. I feel, um, I feel safe with Instagram because I feel like, like, six a.m. fans are very are just like like minded people. Uh, that, that I feel like I would enjoy just sitting down and talking with these people, getting to know about their lives. So I feel like they're friends. Whereas TikTok seems like this this unfamiliar thing to all of these people like yes. my fan my fans on on instagram i almost don't want to ask them to go over to tiktok because <laughs> I, I feel be here i don't know yeah I feel weird. I, I, is this I, a new place <laughs> i feel like they're gonna be like oh then i have to log in now i have to come up with a screen name i have to do all this stuff it's not just like hopping do over there to check dance? out some music do I have to dance? <laughs> that's right <laughs> but so all i this, don't know all this talk is perfect for our sort of how to how people can find you and yeah. and and i and i know that instagram is going to be up there but i feel that right now people listening on the audio broadcast thank you very much we want you on ryan roxy official youtube of course um hit that like button hit that subscribe button but we're here to talk about james and how to get in touch with him vic if you can put up all those links and perhaps james if you can tell people the best way uh that you would like for them to get in touch yeah with you. I, I would i i Instagram, kind of like what we were talking about, is, is really my main hub. and That's James Michael Official. Um, Facebook is also James Michael Official, uh, although Vic, Victor and I were kind of realizing that if you put that in, it, it takes you someplace else. But um, Twitter is James underscore A underscore Michael. Um, YouTube is James Michael Official as well. And yeah, I, I, I have a, the lyric video for California Smile is on my uh, YouTube channel right now. And so I'd love for people to go over and, and check that out once we're done with this podcast and, and subscribe and do all of that stuff. Um, but yeah, the main place where you're going to find me is Instagram and Facebook. There you go. So that's yeah. the best way to find it. Okay, folks. Um, I know that Let the People Speak I, I messed up. I let it go. I let it. I let the link expire. I will not do that again because I used to be able to go back and get all your questions. But the overwhelming, overwhelming question of the day was, uh, what is it like to work with Nikki Six? What is it like to work with Six AM? And for those of you keeping score at home, I just want you to know Six being Nikki Six, A being DJ Ashba. M being James Michael, that's 6 a.m. Yeah, uh, yeah. What is, is there a future? What is the future? And what is the sort of vibe and state of 6 a.m. currently? It's a good question. And yeah, I, I you know, there's a lot of interest in that. Um, it was overwhelming. Like people, yeah. that I, 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 like I remember seeing all the questions. I'm like, I'll get to them. I'll write them. But then, you know, they- Well, they really you know, we kind of, went into hiatus we kind of went away without really letting people know why and the reality was that we were just like i was describing earlier we were all really burnt out um we were three friends that started this band as just a bunch of guys in a room making up songs together and it just turned into something so much more significant over the years and we were so lucky and so blessed to have had the 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 more than a decade long career that we've had so far. Um, and so the, the best way that I can answer the questions about what is the future of 6am and what it, you know, what's going on with them is we are, you know, we have no plans right now to, to do anything moving forward, but I do talk quite regularly with both Nikki and DJ and, um, and we all love what 6am was and became so much that, um, you know, would would I love to make another 6 a.m. record? Absolutely. There's nothing I'd love more than getting back in the room with Nikki and DJ and the whole gang and and uh, and just experiencing that. Because to answer the question, what it's like to work with Nikki and DJ, it's 
it's that it's that that chemistry that you hope you find uh, when you are in this music industry. You hope that you get lucky enough to meet a guy or a couple of guys that you just gel with and that, that you can you know that you can work with on on every level professional and personal um and that's that's what it's been like i think that that you know there were tough times there were very very tough times being in 6am um because we're three very very opinionated people um but it, 99% of the time those strong opinions are also what became the strong support group for one another you know when when i as the producer of the albums would just reach a point where i didn't know what the next right move was i always had my two very very skilled partners to lean on and and to and to just say hey i i i need your input on this where where should we go and and um it was just always that kind of a, a give and take relationship. 6am was always very much a, a, a democracy. We all brought ideas and we all collaborated. We just, we loved that process so much. We laughed our way through a decade of making music. I mean, the three of us, that's the part I look forward to the most is just getting the three of us in a room together because it's just nonstop laughter. Um, and it, it, you know, it's uh, and usually what we come up with is is ends up being something I'm very very proud of. So the best way to describe it is nothing on the horizon, but the door isn't shut. Yeah, I would say that all three of us would say the door is not shut. Um, you know, uh, it's just with six a.m. We never were supposed to be a band in the first place. When we started, we were just like I said, three guys getting together making up songs, and then we recorded those songs. And I wasn't supposed to be the singer. We were just eventually going to find a singer to actually record, you know, put my, you know, take my voice off and put somebody else's voice on. But just through circumstances, it just ended up, you know, taking off. <laughs> Becoming and, all that. Becoming it be, it a, became a world all, of its own. Yeah. 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 And but, I'm, I'm, I'm just grateful for that experience. It's just been amazing. But that being said, you have a lot more new music to release in the coming months. I do. I do. Yeah. In, in, in lieu, yeah. In lieu of, of anything uh, 6 a.m. related moving forward, um, I'm still going to be creating music. And, and like I said, a lot of these songs are, uh, that I'm putting out could very easily have been a 6 a.m. song had I worked on them with Nikki and DJ. You know, they could have very easily turned into that, um, which is what's so cool about the chemistry that, that a song can be one way. You know, for instance, if I were to have taken California Smile and made that a, a 6 a.m. song, I'd love to hear just how different it would be, you know, because those influences would have would have taken it in different directions. That's what's so fun about making music. So Hello. for right now, I'm just uh, I'm just enjoying the process. Did Vic Chalfant shoot that album cover? Because he's put it up about 20 or 30 times today. <laughs> I'm, I'm just wondering, or we, or we might as well give credit. <laughs> I, got the double, I got the double birds from Vic. I love it. Who actually shot that, uh, that album cover? That was, is, uh, dude, you on that your is literally a, a selfie. That is, that is, that is, that is exactly <laughs> how Again, I'm... he puts it up. Again. <laughs> Keep on putting it up, man. Yeah, I don't even, I don't even think that's necessarily a great picture of me. But I was just like, oh, shit, I need some artwork. I'm, I'm uploading this single soon. I need some artwork. So I just snapped it. it yourself. There, there you we go. go. There's Bentley. There's me and Bentley. I love it. Well, there's a man and his dog. And we all know how much Vic loves a man and his dog. <laughs> uh, Stanley has been uh, a, sort of a, a cult hero of the In the Trenches podcast. It's been an amazing episode of In the Trenches podcast. We thank you. Everyone that's, that's helped out, uh, contributed all day long. And that means you, everybody in the chat room. Uh, thank you so much for hanging out here with James Michael. Um, in closing, uh, what I usually do is ask our artist and our special guest um, if there's some sort of uh, creed, some sort of uh, advice that they've gotten that's helped them in their career or just helped them in life in general that you could spread to our listeners. So is there anything that's, uh, that helps you uh, get through the day to day and uh, would you like to share it? You know, um, it's it's a pretty simple concept, um, and I think that it's it's very appropriate in the music business. My advice to uh, to people you know that want to be involved in the music business is just try to be try to be a good person. And I know that sounds kind of cheesy, but 
I, I just always feel like at the core of everything that I've done, I've tried to appreciate the personal relationships more than the, the more than the the business accomplishments. And I've found that the older I get and the longer that I am still a part of this music industry, that those relationships and those those moments of kindness or or, or generosity, they do come back to kind of um, to to define your career in a way. And, and so I, and, and I've always said, you know, there's, there's that expression, uh, nice guys finish last, which is probably true, but I also then follow that up by saying, but that means that nice guys last the longest. And, and I feel, <laughs> and I, and I feel like that's been the case in, in my career. I've, I've just had the good fortune of meeting so many wonderful people and, um, and just appreciating those relationships and the friendships that you forge and, um, and always just being as genuine as possible. It's, it's at the end of the day, it's all you have. Well, it's been a pleasure having you on. Uh, Mr. James Michael, I want to thank Melissa Harding as well for uh, coming in and uh, contributing as well as all of you have been listening. Um, it's been great that we've been able to uh, stay in contact, stay, mu stay uh, working musicians together, um, collaborators. Um, is there any dream collaboration that you have that's still on your bucket list? Yeah. I really want to produce a Rick Springfield album. Um, One of my and favorites I, as well. You know that. Yeah. I, I just, I just, I love, I love just what he exemplified about music. He was just that perfect pop rock guy. He's a great musician. Um, I just think that he would be a fun artist to, uh, to produce an album on. Hero, wasn't he? Wasn't he a oh, working absolutely. class hero? Oh, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, or was it working class dog? What was it? Was, it was, it was working class dog. And then he yeah. had one, I think called success hasn't spoiled me yet. Um, he just, he made great records. He made, he was, you know, I think that he got a, a um, he didn't get the credit he deserved because he was a soap star as well. Right. But boy, he made good, good pop records, and um, and well, I think that would be a fun the one. Universe, all right. You yeah. get him as a you get him as a collaborator for a song, and I'll get him on the podcast. How about that? Because yeah. I'd love yeah. to have him on the podcast as well. James, it's been great having you on. Um, like I said, hang out for just one second while I say goodbye to everybody. But uh, thanks again, everybody. Go check out James Michael Official on Instagram, and then you can find all the other links through there. And, of course, uh, California Smile, which is out right now. You can check that out right as soon as uh, – there's that picture again. Thank you much, very much, Vic. Um, <laughs> You can check out uh, California Smile on his YouTube channel, as well as the Ryan Roxy official YouTube channel, where you can find this podcast and others like it. Um, again, thanks, James. You are a nice guy. You're going to last the longest. And everybody out there, we'll be having more episodes of In the Trenches. I'm just going to have a few more shows with Alice Cooper, so we'll pepper them in here and there, and then we'll be back on a more regular schedule. So stay tuned for our next guest. But you know what? Go rewatch this one with James Michael. It's been great. Thanks again, Melissa. Thank you very much, RGA team, Vic, Federica, Scotty, everybody that's there, David. And uh, until next time, everybody, I'm Ryan Roxy. Enjoy the ride. Trenches with Ryan Roxy.